Good morning, everyone. Thank you, thank you. There's some people who like me. <laughs> oh, so, so just the official announcement, there are 15 days left till Christmas. So for some of you are like, yes. For some of you are like, I got some chopping I still need to do, you know. Um, but so excited to have you with us this morning. My name is Kim ballard I'm the pastor here at uh, Encounter. And uh, for those of you who are here, uh, if you, sc if you uh, scan the QR code in front of you in your chairs, uh, that will give you access to the sermon notes as well as the announcements uh, for today. And then also for those of you that are, that are at home, uh, the QR code should pop up right next to me. Uh, so you have access to be able to utilize that to be able to, again, uh, have access to the sermon notes as well as for the announcements for today as well. So... Again, we're excited. We're continuing our Christmas series this morning, and let me go ahead and open us up in prayer. Uh, Father, we thank you. We, we thank you so much for this morning and for this opportunity to be able to come together to worship you. Father, we just want to take this opportunity to pray for the service today. Uh, Lord, that your hand would be upon it. Uh, Father, that it would be an opportunity for us as we look at being able to overcome the Christmas blues that we'll be able to, to, to see Joseph in his life today and how we could take what he has learned um, in his life with the interruption happened to his life and be able to apply that to our lives as well. And all these things we ask in your name. Amen. Amen. Well, let's go ahead and stand together. If you're watching from home, you can grab your coffee or your tea and you can join us. Sailing on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere go. Sailing on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. Go, tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere go. Tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. Silent flocks by night Behold throughout the heavens There shone a holy light Go tell it on the mountain Over the hills and everywhere Go tell it on the mountain That Jesus Christ is born Low above the earth, rang an angel chorus that hailed our Savior's birth. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. Humble Christ was born and brought us God's salvation that blessed this Christmas morn. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. I saw both night and day, and I asked the Lord to help me, and he showed me the way. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. Oh, 
on the city wall. And if I am a Christian, I am the least of all. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and Sing 
authority, all for the glory, for your glory, Lord, for your glory, Lord. We walk in your victory, we stand in authority, all for the glory, for your glory, Lord, for your glory, Lord. We walk in your victory, we stand in authority, all for the glory. In this season, it's so easy to lose sight of the reason. You know, trying to catch all them deals, all them sales for all the materialistic things that you won't be able to fit later on or <laughs> use later on in the year. <laughs> and so I think it's important that we have to say, what's good about this season is I can celebrate the goodness of God. I love you, Lord. For your mercy never fails me All my days have been held in your hand From the moment that I wake up Until I lay my head down I will sing of the goodness of God And all my life you have been faithful and all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. I love your voice. You have led me through the fire. Darkest night, you are close like no other. I've known you as a father, I've known you as a friend. I have lived in the goodness of God. And all my life, you have been faithful. Yes, you have, Lord. And all my Of the goodness of God. 
this time that we have to praise your name. Lord, I just pray that whatever you have for us today, Lord, that you give us open hearts and open ears to receive whatever you have for us today, Lord. Lord, praying over Ken today and his message as he speaks that you just hide him behind your cross. And Lord, we thank you for every person watching, every person joining us today, Lord. And Lord, we pray. Now, pay attention to the screen to see what's happening at Encounter. Are you new here or just visiting? Well, we love visitors. Right when you sit down, directly in front of you, you should see a little QR code with more information about our service and ways to get involved. Get connected! Have you guys checked out the refreshments table in the back? Crackers, cookies, coffee, tea? Help yourself. Come to the Women's Ornament Exchange Party. When is it? December 10th, 5 p.m. Bring an ornament, $10 or less. Mark your calendars. Sunday, December 17th is Ugly Christmas Sweater Sunday. I hope to see some creativity out there. It's that time to get ready for the Christmas Eve service happening on December 24th at 6 p.m. There's gonna be caroling, eggnog, and so much more. We hope to see you there. Kelsey, I play Miriam in Light of the World, a new Advent musical written by your very own TJ Bunchard. He did the book and lyrics for it, and you have two chances to see it on December 22nd and 23rd. That's a Friday and Saturday, both at 7 p.m. Follow our Instagram, and we'll get you some more ticket information soon. Well, that wraps up our Encounter announcements for this week. Remember, here at Encounter, we want to remind you love up, love out, and love in question for you. What sort of lights did Noah have on his ark? Floodlights! <laughs> oh, that's funny, right? Floodlights. Floodlights. So just a couple of things I wanted to remind you of. First of all, the Women's Ornament Exchange Party is tonight. So is that my hizzle? Or my house for, for some of you. Um, so that's tonight at 5 o'clock. So um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's called a Women's Ornament. So I probably hide in my bedroom and listen to you guys all laugh and have a lot of fun. Um, so again, it's bring an ornament, $10 or less. They're all half off now, so you can get a really great deal on an ornament. And then bring that tonight along with an appetizer or a dessert. It should be a lot of fun. A couple of things I wanted to also remind you of. If you're interested, on the back table, there are these booklets here. They're little devotionals that you can read each day about the Christmas uh, experience. So if you want to read through that, you can grab that. It's on the back table, refreshment table. You can do that as well. The other thing is I want to encourage you to invite people 
this year to the events that we're doing for Christmas. So uh, one is uh, for the light of the world, uh, for our play that we're having on December the 22nd and 23rd. That's on one side of the card. And I know, right, right, right? Look at that. We go, we go high tech here at Encounter. Um, so on the other side is a, an invitation to our Christmas Eve service. If people ask you, well, what is your church like? There's a QR code on it that will take them to an introduction to Encounter, what Encounter is all about. It's a, it's a video. It's like maybe uh, three to five minutes or so. It actually takes them to our welcome page. On that welcome page is something that tells you, you know, what Encounter is all about. So um, invite people to come for that. Also, in regards to our Christmas Eve service, since it's on a Sunday, that Sunday morning we will not have a, Christ, a, a service that Sunday morning at 1030 on Christmas Eve. We're just going to have the one service on Sunday evening at 6. Uh, so if you come at 1030, um, feel free to help decorate the church or something. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> but it should be a lot of fun, so invite people to come uh, for that as well. And, and so I wanted to ask this question, and it's simply this. How many of you find interruptions annoying? You know, how many of you? Yeah, right, right, right. And, and, and how about this? How, does this has ever happened to you? You're in your office. You're feverishly typing. You got a stack of papers that you're trying to get done. And, and you, you sense a presence standing there, but you're not going to acknowledge it because you're trying to get stuff done. And all of a sudden you get the... Uh, are you busy? <laughs> right, right. And, and so, and so your response is no. I just like to like like to try to look like I'm busy, but obviously I'm failing. <laughs> you know. Oh, so then you're not busy. Uh, do you understand sarcasm? Do you? You know. But but yeah, uh, uh, interruptions can be annoying. If you're driving down a street, you're trying to, or if you're on the freeway and you're trying to get to work on time, and all of a sudden the gas light comes on, right? Annoying. Or maybe even worse, the check engine light comes on. So you know that's a, that's a bigger interruption. Uh, it's, it's so funny. The difference between my wife and I, when that gas light comes on, I'm like, oh, we need to get gas right now. My wife is like, we got 32 more miles. We're, 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 we're good. <laughs> so... Uh, so, that, so that's how my wife deals with interruptions. She just keeps on driving, you know. Uh, but it's just, it's just really interesting. So, um, but here's the reality. Some interruptions in life, they're annoying, but you can get beyond them, right? But, but, but there are other interruptions in life that are life-changing. And as a result of those interruptions in life, your life may never be the same. You know, sometimes... For the Christmas season, people really wrestle during this time of the year because in some way for, for, uh, in some way or fashion, their life was interrupted and interrupted in such a way that the life will never be the same again. And, and so what happens is, again, for everyone that, you know, during this time of the year, it is a season to be jolly, but for some, that's not a reality for their life. And so we're doing this series called rediscovering the joy of Christmas. And here's what we're doing is we're looking at the lives of those that are in the Christmas story to see how their lives, their plans were interrupted. And then to see how, what can we learn from them so that we can be able to take and implement to, into our lives so that we can be able to overcome the Christmas blues. But again, sometimes it, it just kind of happens, right? Where there's, there's just this interruption. I remember one year, I believe it was, it was either for Thanksgiving or for Christmas. I can't remember. Probably most likely Christmas. Uh, what used to happen is my, uh, my wife's extended family, sometimes we would get together for, it was Christmas. We would get together for Christmas, and then we'd spend the night somewhere, and everybody's hanging out and gathering together. And, and so this, that, that on that particular year, um, I woke up that night. I was feeling a little sick, and, you know, I thought I'd feel better in the morning. And so my, my father-in-law had a fifth wheel, and so they drove the fifth wheel because we were going to sleep in the fifth wheel. And then I, you know, I was laying down in the fifth wheel. And I'll give you this piece of advice. Never lay down in the fifth wheel if you're trying to lay down in the fifth wheel, if you're not feeling well. There are times where I got some, I got some air, you know, laying, <laughs> laying down, you know. But we get to the party, 
and I'm still not feeling better. I'm still not feeling better. And um, come to find out I had the stomach flu. You know, so, so what happened is they quarant me, quarantined me to a room, and everybody else is eating, like, Thanksgiving tur or Christmas turkey and, and yams and green beans and mac and cheese. I am eating crushed ice. You know, so, so there are times where, it, again, interruptions can be annoying when it comes to that. But there's also sometimes physical interruptions that will happen that can maybe change your life forever. And there's a woman named uh, Saluki Juwad, and she was 23 years old. Had just graduated from college and was getting ready to start her life. And, and she actually wrote about her life being interrupted. And, and here's what she says in one part. She says, I was so excited for what lay ahead. I nearly forgot to wave goodbye to my parents. Armed with a college diploma, my first job offer, a, a one-way ticket to Paris, and a new pair of heels, I was ready to take on anything. Little did I know that I would be back in New York seven short months later, but my parents would not be taking pictures at the airport or chatting about my future plans. I would be in a wheelchair, too weak to walk. She finds out later that she actually has, is diagnosed with leukemia. So then she goes on, she says, cancer has forced me to pause my life at a time when my peers are just beginning theirs. For my friends, most of them young adults in their 20s, this is an exciting time as they look forward to starting new jobs, traveling the world, going to parties, dating and finding love, and all the rest of the small and big milestones that are part of early adulthood. But as a young cancer patient, it's difficult to see ahead when I'm fighting for my life. I, I don't know what the future holds. I just know that I want to be there. And, and she, talks about, she talks about going in for cancer treatment and she's the youngest person in the room. And, and you know, and, and trying to navigate that in your 20s. And she went on to say this, and you can read this right on the screen as well. She said, cancer doesn't just put your life on hold. It's not like you get to skip back a few months and then pick up exactly where you left off. I wasn't going to get my old life back. That's a powerful statement, isn't it? And it, it's so true. When you suffer from a sickness or something that you're going through, especially if it's a long-term sickness, like, the, like you, you can't just go back and just kind of pick up where you left off. Because sometimes your life is completely different. Your life has completely changed. And again, for, for many of us, you know, this is the time of the year where we're thinking about, uh, you know, the people that we've lost. Unfortunately, the, you know, there's a funeral that I'm going to be doing on December 20th. Can you imagine that? On December 20th, that's just five days till Christmas. And, and it just seems like, you know, this time of the year, if there is a passing or if there is a loss, if you lose your job, it, it seems like if there is an element of suffering that happens this time of the year, it seems to hit harder, doesn't it? It, it just feels a little bit more of an impact because of just the timing of the year and what we're, when we're hit. And, and, and so... You know, we're looking at disappointment over the course of this series. And, and really, the reason why we have the Christmas blues is because we're disappointed. And we're disappointed because life isn't working out the way that we wanted it to. Or, or this time is not working out the way that we wanted it to. Or the connection's not working out the way that we wanted it to. Or, or having that loss at this time is not something that we wanted to go through at this time. And remember this statement about disappointment. We said this last week. You see this on the screen as well. Disappointment is a negative emotion you feel when an outcome doesn't match up to your expectations. It's a disappointment you feel at that time. And so last week, we looked at Mary and just the interruption in her life and how she navigated that. So if you weren't here last week or if you didn't see the message last week, please go back and watch the replay of our live stream. You can watch it right online. Um, you can also go to our website and watch it there, too. But this week, what we're going to do is we're going we're gonna to spend some time, and we're going to look at Joseph and see how Joseph navigated this challenge that he went through in his life as well. So it says in Matthew chapter 1, verse 18, it says, this is how Joseph, I'm sorry, this is how Jesus, the Messiah, I'm sorry, I got those J's mixed up, didn't I? A lot of J's, but, but this is how Jesus, the Messiah, was born. His mother Mary was engaged to be married to a man to, to be married to Joseph. But before the marriage took place, 
while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. So again, we, we looked at Mary's perspective last week about, you know, being engaged and everything. And so now I, I just want to take some time to, to out this week to look at Joseph and just the challenges he went through in being able to navigate this. And for those of you, just a quick highlight of something that we said last week is, is typically what would happen is uh, the marriages back in those times were, were arranged, but it's different than other cultures. Usually in other cultures, you would have the bride, uh, the bride's family would approach the groom's family and there'd be a, a dowry that would be paid. But in the Jewish culture at that time, what would happen is the father of the groom would go to the father of the bride and say, hey, I, I want my son to be matched to your daughter kind of thing. Uh, and then usually what they would do is they would give what's called a mohar. And the mohar uh, incorpor incorporated things like uh, it could be money, it could be services, uh, it, it could also be property or something along those lines. So they would give that to the, to the father of the bride so that their children could be matched. And the interesting thing is sometimes the children would never see each other until the actual betrothal happened. So hopefully, hopefully uh, they were happy with what they saw. <laughs> I'm gonna be. I'm gonna be stuck with you for the rest of my life. Like, like, Dad, did you look at him first? You know. Um, but so that's what. So what would happen is, is if the father of the bride accepted, then what they would do is there were two ceremonies. There was the Arison ceremony and the Nissen ceremony. At the Arison ceremony, that was when the betrothal would happen. And so at the betrothal what would happen is that the bride would go through a cleansing process as well as the groom. They would go through a cleansing process, and then what they would do is they would make a commitment to each other uh, to be able to make a commitment to, to get married, you know, that kind of thing. And so, and the difference between engagement then compared to an engagement now, like if I say bye-bye in the engagement, it's bye-bye. Uh, there's no papers that need to be signed. It's just, you know, I'm out. Uh, but back then, when you went to the betrothal, it was actually like being legal. You were legally bound at that point when you actually went through the betrothal ceremony. And so what would happen at the betrothal ceremony is that the, the groom would then give his bride what's called a matan. And the matan is similar to the mohar, where it would be some money, it would be property, it would be something along those lines where the bride would, you know, be able to be a gift to her. And then also what they would do is they would have a cup of wine at the end of the ceremony, and as a result of that wine, and maybe, you know, depending on who they were married, there's more than a cup. Depending on who it is. Um, but um, they would have a cup of wine, and then as, as a result of that cup of wine, at that point, they are legally bound. So now this is Joseph and Mary at this point. And then it says in Matthew chapter 1, verse 19, Joseph, to whom she was engaged, was a righteous man and did not want to disgrace her publicly. So he decided to break the engagement quietly. So what would happen is, again, um, Joseph at this point finds out that Mary's pregnant. And you know how that conversation goes. We kind of talked about this last week just a little bit, where Mary's like, no, 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 I wasn't with the man. It was done by God. And so, you know, just imagine yourself being Joseph. Like, that is, just, that is just so outside of the realm of the possibility that you think, man, you, come, you couldn't come up with a better lie than that, Mary, you know, kind of thing. Um, and, and so... This is now what's going on in Joseph's head. Like, who is this woman? Who did, who did my father approach? Who did he try to connect me with? What did you, did you, dad, um, did you do some research on this woman? Just kind of find out what kind of woman she is. Because, uh, uh, pop, she's preggers. <laughs> you know, I mean, just imagine what, what Joseph is feeling at this time. Uh, and, and. Here's the thing that's really interesting as well, is what the bridegroom would do is the bridegroom would find a trusted friend, and that trusted friend was responsible for spending time with the bride and helping to prepare the bride and getting the bride ready. Also, the job of that, the, of that friend was to watch over the bridegroom to make sure that there were no improprieties that happened, you know, that kind of thing. So, so imagine Joseph and this friend, like, dude! You just had one job. 
You just had one job. And have you ever had that experience? Well, there are certain people that you just say to them, look, man, you just have one job. And then they drop the ball. I, I want to give you a couple examples. Like, for example, take a look at this first picture. <laughs> Do you guys see a problem with that? The, 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 the English tutor? Like, bro, you just had one job. So here's the question is, am I going to be learning English? Or do I need to wear a mask to this meeting? <laughs> you know? like, what does that mean? Or let's say you hire someone to do graphics for you, and you send them the, the, the quote is, is, never quit. Do your best. And you want them to come up with a graphic for you. They just have one job, and they come up with this. Never do your best, quit, <laughs> right? Dude, you just had one job. So, again, just, so just imagine Joseph's frustration, you know, in this moment as well. And, and back in those times, if, if a woman was caught in the act, because realize they're legally bound at this point, so if a woman is caught in the act, like seen in the act of adultery, the, the penalty was like instant death right then and there. Um, but if she wasn't caught, then the groom would have the, have the right to be able to just divorce her quietly. And so that's what Joseph was going to do. He didn't want to expose her to public disgrace. So this kind of just shows the kind of person that, that Joseph is at this point. But also realize now... By going through this process, Joseph also realized what he's, what he's giving up, what he's giving up. Because what would happen is on the day of the, of the Nissen, uh, before that happens, what's happening is, is, is the bride is preparing herself. And, and so as it gets closer, because usually this, this, the process between the betrothal and the actual wedding ceremony was probably about a year. It's probably about a year long. So, so you know that as, as you're getting close, you know he's going to be coming soon. And so, so, so the bride was in this mode of, of preparation. As a matter of fact, they would even keep, uh, they would keep a lamp trimmed with oil and ready to go just in case the groom decided to come at 2 o'clock in the morning, you know, or, or something like that. And, and so what would happen is when they would start the nissen, what would happen is all the wedding party, the people that are invited, they're at the groom's house. And so this march would start down, and everybody's, oh, come on, you know, kind of thing. And they're dancing and celebrating. Woohoo! They're getting married. So they're doing that whole thing. And then as they get closer to the house, someone would come out and, the bridegroom cometh! You know, it would be that kind of announcement. It would be that kind of, I don't know if that was the horn sound, but it would be something like that, you know. And, and, so, then, and so then what would happen is when the, when the bride's family would hear that, then what they would do is they would give a, a blessing to the bride. And then they would cover the bride with the veil. And then what would happen is that the groom would come. I had to pick up my bride, you know. So the groom would come. And then what they would do is they'd take the bride and they'd put her on a, and you kind of see semblances of this. If you've ever been to a Jewish wedding, you notice that at one point they'll t like take the bride and put them on a chair. And kinda, so, so that kind of originated from this. Because what they would do is they would put the bride on a piece of furniture and they would carry the bride to the, to the groom's home. And then when they would arrive at the groom's home, that's when the wedding ceremony would start. And so Joseph realizes, like, I'm losing all of that. I, I'm losing that experience. I'm losing that experience. And then, as you begin to think about this, so then what would happen at the Nissan? is they would do that. Again, remember we talked about the hoopah. They're going under the hoopah. It's, it's not, the hoopah meant canopy or covering. And again, so they're under the covering of God. And they would, do their, they would do their vows. And then they would go. And then they would consummate their wedding. Remember we talked about that last week. We won't go into it. But watch that last week because of the funny part. But, but they would consummate their wedding. And then after they would consummate their wedding, then the reception would begin. And the reception or the wedding party would last a minimum of seven days. <laughs> seven days. Yeah, that's, that's crazy, right? And 
the cool thing is that, you know, that's different today is the father of the groom would be responsible for the party. So me having two daughters, I'd be like, good luck there, buddy. Have a good time. Because a seven-day reception ain't cheap, right? So remember, so, so remember, this is when Jesus, remember Jesus is at the wedding in Cana? So odds are this wedding, this wedding party had been going on for days. And, and so they run out. So it's not like they were at the wedding and they ran out of the wedding, ran out of wine probably the first day. No, no, it, it probably been going for days. And then all of a sudden, now they run out of wine. And so Jesus does his first miracle. But could you imagine that? Like a seven-day party. Like I'm excited about my daughters getting married and my sons getting married as well. I'm excited about that, but not for seven days. Right? But so realize Joseph is losing all of that. He's losing all of that. So then he lays his head down and there's an interaction that happens. And it's in this interaction that we get some perspective on how to be able to navigate Christmas blues. So it, it says this in Matthew chapter 1, verses 20 and 21. In verse 20 it says, As he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, the angel said, Do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit. And she will have a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So, imagine, you're at this point, you're disappointed, you're frustrated, maybe you're hurt, because you had plans for what your life was going to be. And, and so you lay your head down, and all of a sudden, an angel appears. And that angel, first of all, confirms what Mary had said. Confirms it. And it's very interesting because the, the, the statement that the angel makes is, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife. Don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife. Because what would he be afraid of? We kind of know. Right? She could even wait a year. And she's pregnant. What happens? Because remember, Joseph is a carpenter. So imagine if he goes to, you know, so he travels to somewhere and he travels to Jerusalem to install a cabinet set you know, or something like that. And, and so then, you know, he has to come back and the whole time he's stressed out like, will she be faithful? Will she be faithful? Will she be faithful? Because she couldn't be faithful during the patrol. Well, what happens if somebody comes up? So imagine those are the kind of worries and concerns that he's thinking about for the future. So he had every reason to be afraid up until this point. So, again, we said this before, that disappointment is a negative emotion you feel when an outcome doesn't match your expectations. Disappointment. Is a negative emotion you feel when the outcome does not match your expectations. This did not match Joseph's expectations at all. So we can understand why he would feel this disappointment. We can understand why he would struggle and wrestle in this moment. But what the angel does is the angel says, do not be afraid. So you know what the angel does is the angel tackles Joseph's struggle head on. And so I think if we're going to overcome the Christmas blues, what we need to do is make a commitment to name our disappointment head on and, and name whatever the cause of it is head on and name whatever it is that we're feeling head on. Like, be willing to face it. Because, again, unfortunately, this is the time of the year where if we are struggling with Christmas blues, we feel guilty of it, right? We feel guilty because everybody else is happy. Everybody else is having a good time. And, and here's what we don't want to be. Because sometimes what we do is we say, you know what, I don't want to go to Christmas parties. Why? Because I don't want to be Debbie Downer at the Christmas party. I, I don't want to be around other people. Because I don't, I don't want to, I'm not happy, and I don't want to, I don't, I don't want to fake it and be around, you know, these people. So, again, what we do is we, we isolate ourselves, and we never take the opportunity 
to really face it head on. Name it, identify it, face it head on. And then once you begin to do that, I, I love this because what did God do to help comfort Joseph is God sent an angel. So realize that when you're able to face it head on, now what you could do is say, God, I need your presence. I need you to walk, with, I need you to walk through this with me. I need you to wrestle with this with me. I, I need you. And, and so if you're wrestling with the Christmas blues, pray that prayer. Do that. Be real with what the struggle is. But then the angel does something else. So the angel addresses his fears, and then what the angel says is, look, the woman that, uh, the baby that is conceived inside of Mary, that will be the savior of the world, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save the world from their sins. And, and so here's another key, and the key is this, and you can see this on the screen. The key to beating Christmas blues is to find a new dream. The key to beating Christmas blues is to find a a new dream. And so that's what the angel does, is the angel gives Joseph a new dream. So, so now you may be wrestling with, well, Ken, what does that look like? Well, if I'm struggling, let's say, for example, if I am wrestling with the loss of a loved one, what does it look like to find a new dream? Because this is important. Here's what I love that the angel didn't do. What the angel didn't do is the angel didn't say, hey, buck up, buddy. So what, you missed your wedding? You're talking about the Savior, the Savior of the world. <laughs> Come on. So it's important to realize that the new dream isn't a replacement for the old desires. It isn't that. The new dream doesn't replace the old desires. It just redirects your path. That's the goal of the new dream. So let's say, for example, if you have lost someone, what are some things that you could do to begin to establish a new dream? Maybe one of the things that you could do is, is maybe do a dedication. What did they love to do? What was one of their favorite things that they did during the holidays? Maybe do it in honor of them. Because sometimes what we do is we feel like we feel guilty, right, that, that we don't want to do that. and Do that. Do it in honor of them. Because one of the ways that you can have a new dream is you can still keep their presence or the thought of them alive as you continue to move forward. So have that moment. Maybe begin to create new traditions, ways that you can honor. Maybe a new tradition might be, hey, we'll, we'll do a place setting in honor of my mom or in honor of my dad, just to kind of remind us of them and their presence and the role that they played in my life. So I'm not saying ignore it, but, but just maybe remind yourself of that. And then also maybe what you might want to do as a result as, you, as you're going through and you're trying to figure out how to, to navigate th that loss, then if, if there's something that your mom or dad or whoever it is that you lost, if that's something that they, that they regularly did, like, for example, if your mom was, my mom was the one that hosted Christmas. Like we always went over to my mom's house. That was the place to go. Well, then maybe what you need to do is, is, is maybe move it. Maybe move it to your home or maybe move it to a home of your brother or sister or maybe rotate homes. But move it to a new place. But once you move it to a new place, maybe have something that remembers your mom to keep that memory alive. But I will also tell you this. Don't compare it to what your mom did. Because isn't that what we do sometimes? Like, so it's, I'll make sweet potatoes because I know mom is, and then you, it tastes, you should not have made those sweet potatoes because they're nothing like my mama's, <laughs> you know? So, so resist the desire to compare what it is, but, but begin to create things that are new as you're, as you're moving forward and beginning to develop those elements in your life as well. And then, not only that, Plan for the tough moments. If the loss that you had, especially if it's fresh, prepare for the tough moments. And if that means that maybe you were at a Christmas party with the family and everything, and then you start to feel emotional, feel free to give yourself 
room to go outside, maybe take a walk, breathe, maybe go in the bathroom, cry if you need privacy. But feel free to give yourself, because again, one of our challenges with the Christmas blues is we tell ourselves we shouldn't feel what it is that we're feeling, but the reality is it's what we're feeling. It's what we're going through. It's what we're wrestling with. So don't deny it. Face it. So, but give yourself room to, to be able to process it and to do that. So just begin, again, to, to look at how you are navigating that loss. Again, if you're someone, let's say, for example, you lose your job. Now I'm not able to provide for my family for Christmas this year. Is You have to remember that Christmas is not about the, the, the caliber of the gift, is it? It's not about that. But I think sometimes we feel guilty, though. Like, I feel guilty because, you know, I used to go out and, you know, bought a PlayStation 5 for my kid last year, <laughs> you know, like we're, we're, we're used to going out and surprising our kids, and the, but because of our finances this year, we just don't have the ability to be able to do that. Um, well, don't allow that to make you feel guilty. It's just kind of where life is at this point, point. and rather than focusing on what you can't do, a new dream is focusing on what you can, the kind of Christmas that you can provide, because we all learned from that old traditional hymnal called How the Grinch Stole Christmas. <laughs> right, and I'm not going to sing for you guys or anything like that. But we learn from How the Grinch Stole Christmas, right, that Christmas is not about the gifts, right? Christmas is about presents. It's about people. It's about, and when I say presents, I'm not talking about presents. I'm talking about presents. C-E, not T-S, right? It's about the gatherings. It's about the connections. It's about the relationships. We, we focus on what the heart of Christmas is all about. Also, the heart of Christmas is about Christ and who Christ is and what Christ brings in the world is, is to remind us of that. So again, we get the Christmas blues because we focus on what it is that we've lost. We focus on the dream that has been deferred. But what I want to encourage us to do in order to rediscover the joy of Christmas is, A, be honest about what you feel, but then embrace the new dream that the angel gives you. And it goes on and it says in Matthew chapter 1, verses 24 and 25, it says, When Joseph woke up, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded and took Mary as his wife. So when you have this, begin to move forward. Then it goes on and it says, But he did not have sexual relations with her until her son was born. And Joseph named him Jesus. So in other words, you know what it's saying? Joseph did the nissen. He went through the process. He had the wedding ceremony with her. So in other words, he was able, still even able to recapture some of it because the angel gave that dream, in a sense, back to him and also gave him a new dream. So he was able to kind of recapture some of it and began to be able to move forward. Now, uh, and, and notice again, it says that he, didn't have, he did not have sexual relations to her, with her until after Jesus was born. Because I want to make sure that we, we, we understand this too, because there is this misnomer out there that Mary was, was a virgin for the entirety of her. No, 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 that's not true. You know, Joseph was like, Jesus is born. <laughs> let's, let's go. Let's go. I've been waiting. I've been waiting. Um, and they also had more children. Yes, Jesus had other brothers. You know, he, he, had, he, had, he had some siblings along the way as well. Um, but it's important to realize that the angel reconnected them, and they were, and, or God reconnected them, and they were able to create something beautiful as a result. So as you look at navigating your Christmas blues and your loss, I understand how difficult that can be. But if we can begin to allow ourselves to process this way, then maybe what we can do is we can see the change happen that we desire to see happen, and we can be able to navigate it as we go through this. And, and maybe, just maybe, we can capture the joy of Christmas once again as a result of it. So again, here at An Encounter, we encourage you to love up, love, and love. So what we want to do with every single one of our messages is to look at how we can help you to be able to do that. And so the first thing we want to encourage you to do is love up. And remember, love up is that we fall madly and passionately in love with a God who's madly and passionately in love with us. So what I want to encourage you to do, invite God into your journey. When it comes to love, invite God into your journey. God, I'm, I'm hurt, I'm angry, I'm frustrated. I'm, invite God into your journey. Be real with God. A again, and you guys heard me say this before, it's not like God's going to go, huh, what? Oh, 
Oh, no, you didn't. No, God's not, <laughs> God's not going to do that. God's going to be there. He's going to walk through it with you. But here's the deal. This is, this is really important for you to understand. God can only walk through with you as much as you allow him to and invite him to. Again, in scriptures it says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. But it's still up to you to open the door. It's still, so, so when you are going through difficulty and when you're going through hard time, God is knocking. I'm here. I'm here. I love you. I want to walk with you through this. My spirit is with you. My compassion, my mercy is there. But it's up to you to decide whether or not you want to open that door or not. And once you do, invite him in. Invite him in. The other thing is love out. Remember, love others the way that God loves us. And love out. Ask for help and support as you begin a new normal. Invite, like, so you want to invite God in, but you also want to invite people in. The right people, though. Right, because we've talked about this in the past, too. Because some people, you don't want to invite to your troubles. <laughs> you just don't. So you also want to invite the right people in. People that are mature, people that are growing, people that are also maturing in their relationship with God as well. But here's the thing that's really beautiful. And you guys have probably all experienced this as well. There's nothing that brings two people closer together than vulnerability. Amen? And here's the truth. Because, you know, there, there's an adage like, fake it until you, right? Well, what if I ain't making it? <laughs> I'm faking, faking, but I ain't making nothing. So maybe what you could do is find some people that you don't have to fake it with. And just say, hey, here's where I'm at in my journey. And, and maybe that person could, uh, you could even be, hey, hey, I'm getting together with my family, but I'm feeling a sense of loss. It's okay if I just send you a text saying pray for me on Christmas Day if I'm, if I'm, if I'm wrestling, if I'm struggling. And they might say, no, nah, dude, don't bother me. No, no, they wouldn't say that. <laughs> Most people would be like, yeah, feel free to send me a text. I might not get to it until the evening because I'm busy with my own Christmas stuff, but I will pray for you if I see it. But invite people in that journey with you. And then love in. And then the idea with love in is that we're growing in peace and purpose in our lives. So with love in, here's what we encourage you to do is be patient with yourself. Be patient with yourself. Uh, if you're navigating loss and grief and disappointment, you're going to have ups and downs. And, and there will be days where you feel more connected with others. There will be days when you feel more bonded with others. And there will also be days where you don't want to be around a single person. There will also be days when you feel more broken than, it, than, than other days. There will, there will be days where maybe you smell something, see something, feel something, experience something, hear something. You, you, maybe, maybe you're listening to Christmas songs and then you hear your, that relative, that favorite Christmas song, and then it hits you, it takes you back to that place. You, you may have that. Be patient with yourself. And allow yourself to feel what it is that you feel, but be patient with yourself. Because the worst thing that you can do is say, I, I should be over this by now. Because don't we do that? Don't we do that to ourselves? Would you guys agree? Don't we do that to ourselves? Don't we beat ourselves up by saying, I should be over this by now? I also want to encourage you with this, though, too. If you get to a point where you need help, it's okay for you to reach out for counseling. It's okay for you to do that. And, and if somebody else judges you for reaching out to counseling, that's their problem. That's their problem. No one ever judges you for going to a doctor, do they? If something's going on and you go to urgent care, do people ever judge you for that? No. But thank goodness that we're in the age where mental health, people are recognizing that mental health really is a challenge and a struggle and wrestle that people are going through. And there, there, there's more patience for people that are having mental health struggles now than there's ever been. And praise God for that. Praise God for that. Because... God may have blessed physicians to help us physically, but I also believe that he's blessed counselors and psychiatrists that can help us mentally and emotionally. So if you need to see a counselor to navigate this, give yourself permission and go get the help that you need so that you can begin to be able to move forward and heal. Nothing wrong with that at all. And if I said that there was, TJ would throw something at me because he's trying to become a therapist. 
<laughs> All of a sudden, you see a water bottle come flying out. The <laughs> and not just like a plastic with a bing. <laughs> like, what did you say again? You know. Um, but get the help that you need. And give yourself permission to do that. And that could be the door that allows you to get healing and open, openness as well. Father, I, I thank you. I, I thank you for those of us who are here and those of us who are watching, I, I pray that we are reminded of your compassion and of, of your mercy and of your, of your goodness. Lord, I, I pray that we would seek you. And, and just to be reminded, like, God, you, you've moved mountains. God, you've healed. God, you've restored. And God, if you've walked us with us through difficulty, you can walk with us again. And if you've moved in the past, you can move again. And, and so, Lord, I just pray that you would increase our understanding and our awareness of you, especially during this holiday season. And, and I pray that for that person who is grieving right now, for that person who's struggling, for the person who feels like they're in a place where they just can't move forward, Lord, I, I pray that you would use this moment, Father, to reach out to them. To remind them, I sent my son for you so that you can be with me. Because that's the Christmas message. My son is here. So now you can be with me. And I pray that we will understand that. And that we will begin to pursue you. And I seems to ask in your name. Amen. Walking around these walls I thought by now they'd fall But you would never fail me yet Waiting for change to come Knowing the battle's won for you have never failed me yet. Your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness, faithfulness. I'm still in your hands. This is my confidence. You never failed me yet.
I've seen you move. You move the mountains, and I believe I've seen you do it again. You made a way when there was no way, and I believe I've seen you. think about the idea of confidence and what confidence is. And it's important to realize this, that your confidence is only as strong as whatever it is rooted in. Say it again. Your confidence is only as strong as whatever it is rooted in. And so maybe it's a good idea that if you're struggling with the Christmas blues is to ask yourself, what's my confidence rooted in? What was it that shook my confidence? What is it that rocked me? And then we begin to look at, because this song is really about having that confidence, that, that trust in God. And, and so maybe what we can begin to do is say, God, help me to realign my confidence. Because you've never failed me yet. So help me to realign my confidence in you so that I am rooted and grounded in you. So, Father, I do, I want to pray for everyone who's watching the live stream or everyone who's in this room. Lord, that we are reminded of your presence and who you are, and again, for the way that you make yourself and your name known to us. And, and Father, you know, as we look at the Christmas season, it is a declaration of that that we could trust you, that we could trust your word, that we could trust your presence. And, and so, Father, I, I just pray that we are able to reestablish ourselves in that. Lord, I, I just want to pray for that person who is, 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 is found, again, finds himself in this place where they are struggling and they're stuck. And, Lord, that they're able to hand that over to you and reaffirm themselves and reground themselves in the relationship that they have with you and being able to move forward and, and find healing in their lives. God, I thank you for who you are. And I know that this falls in place with so many people during this holiday season. And so, Lord, I just pray that this is an opportunity for them to find breakthrough in their lives. And, and maybe that breakthrough can start with one simple word. Yes. Yes. And so I just pray that there's those who are in this room or watching the live stream, that they'll come to that place well, they'll say, Jesus, yes, I invite you in. I invite you into my life. I invite you in. 
Not saints, we ask in your name. Amen. And so if you've made that prayer, like, I want to invite Jesus in, we would love the opportunity to pray for you. If you're inviting him into your life as a whole, we would love to pray for you. If you are inviting him into your struggle and your wrestle, we would also love to pray for you. And so one of the ways that you could do that is through the, through the QR code. If you go to our online bulletin, there's a spot that you can hit and you can put your prayer request there. We'll see that. We would love the opportunity to be able to pray for you. If you're watching on a live stream, you can use that QR code. You can also be able to put it in on that part as well. For those of you that want to support Encounter financially, Thank you so much for your willingness to, be, to, to do so. And what you can do is you can drop your offering in the, bo- in the two boxes as you're walking out. Also, you can utilize that QR code, uh, whether you're here or watching on the live stream, you'll be able to give that way as well. But we are so excited about hopefully that this will be an opportunity for every single one of us to begin to find breakthrough and find it happen in our lives. Well, please stand and join us for our last song as we get ready to head out. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Yeah.